Hi, it's Chris. Welcome back here on Catching Photons. This is the second part of the tutorial's first episode, what is there to see in the night sky? In the first part, we covered the objects inside our solar system. We saw the sun and the moon and discovered just how tiny but bright the planets appear in the night sky, that we need a long scope to observe or image them. In today's part 2, we'll expand our view, leave the solar system and target the so-called deep sky objects. We will see nebulas, star clusters and galaxies populating our night sky and you will be surprised by their properties. So we leave the solar system and travel a few light years. Stars everywhere, thousands in our neighborhood, millions and billions further out. Our galaxy contains roughly 100 to 400 billion stars. Unimaginable. Even though most people do assume astronomers would look for single stars through their scope, that's not entirely true. Single stars, like Vega, have their beauty. But without those pretty diffraction spikes, stars are dots and look all the same. So what we normally do, we look for star formations or rich star fields. To do that, we observe big parts of the sky and their star structure. That's the beauty. Therefore, we only need a short scope, and as stars tend to be bright, a thin scope is enough for the beginning. Traveler scopes like that are often used for rich field observations, as we call it. So let's zoom out even further. Second thing we can observe in the night sky are nebulas. Lights from those objects traveled roughly a few hundred or thousand years to reach us, the so-called interstellar neighborhood. Those nebulas are made out of gas floating between stars, the interstellar gas. This gas is mostly hydrogen, oxygen, helium and traces of other elements. The nebulas can be divided into two groups. First group are the so-called emission nebulas. UV radiation from massive and bright stars energizes the gas atoms and forces the electrons to climb to higher energy states. That can be done by different interaction methods, however, the electrons will then drop back into their old energy states. They will do that following the ladder of possible energy states. With every drop, the energy difference is emitted as a photon, so as light, with a certain color. As the energy ladder is unique to each element, the emitted color lines are like a fingerprint of that element. So emission nebulas shine in their unique colors, mostly near infrared. And as you extend your skills, you can use filters sensitive only to those colors to pick up faint details of the target. For every target, you then want to choose the best suited narrow band filter but we're way ahead of us. The second type of nebulas are reflection nebulas. They, too, are made out of interstellar dust and gas and they are simply illuminated by nearby stars, reflecting their light, same as the moon reflects the sun's light. Nebulas in our sky have different brightness levels and different sizes, but to paint them with the same brush, here's the thumb rule for nebulas. They are faint, too faint to see with the naked eye, and they are huge in the sky. But what means huge in astroterms? Here are some nebulas in Stellarium and we are going to compare them with the familiar moon. This is the famous Orion Nebula. It has nearly three times the size of the full moon in the sky and can be spotted with the naked eye if you know where to look. This is the much fainter North American Nebula. This nebula is huge. And this one is the beautiful Horsehead Nebula next to Orion. The whole section of the sky is nearly three times the moon as well. So what's the best scope to observe nebulas? Firstly, they're faint. Therefore you need a scope as wide as possible. But don't worry, for long astro-imaging sessions an 80mm scope can do the job. All you need then are longer exposures. Secondly, as we saw, the nebulas appear often very big in the sky. So the best suited scope is a very short one. Otherwise you will cut off parts of the objects wide and short. Next step in our journey brings us a step further out. Within all the stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, there are stars clumping together. They are the so-called star clusters. And there are two types of clusters to be distinguished. The first ones are the open star clusters. They are like sibling groups of stars. They are formed from the same gas cloud and are now moving close together in roughly the same direction. They can take different shapes, more dense or slightly looser formations. As they travel through the Milky Way, the gravitational pull of other stars and objects will slowly rip these clusters apart, 
leaving solitary stars like our own Sun behind. The second type are globular clusters. They are still kind of a mystery to astrophysicists. They are much denser than open star clusters and the gravitational pull of the stars themselves give them a spherical form. The star density in the center of globulars can be enormous. Light from our Sun needs approximately four years to reach the next neighbor. In the core region of globulars, stars are days apart, dancing and flipping around like part of a giant roller coaster. Globulars are older than open star clusters and found slightly out of our galaxy, orbiting the galaxy core in the form of a big halo. A theory tells that they are left over cores of smaller baby galaxies captured and eaten by the big central galaxy. Observations show the bigger the galaxy, the more globular clusters seem to orbit it. That seems to support the theory. How big do they appear in our night sky? Here are some examples from Stellarium. As you can see, the sizes do vary a bit, either way. The bigger, wider the scope, the more stars and fainter stars can be distinguished. The length of your best suited scope varies with the size of targets, let's say intermedium length. Now we are at the edge of our galaxy, let's step out into the void. Our galaxy is huge, light travels 170,000 years across it. The nearest galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. This galaxy is 2.5 million light years away and that's a close neighbor in astro terms. Before Hubble's observations on certain types of supernovae to measure vast distances, nobody knew whether the fuzzy clouds observed in the sky are inside our galaxy or objects of their own. Hubble's discovery drastically expanded our map of the universe. Look at that. Every dot in this image taken by Hubble telescope is one giant galaxy containing hundreds of billions of stars like our Sun. Billions of stars, billions of planets, moons, worlds, ten thousands islands in this tiny patch of the sky alone. Lucky us, we, today, can observe those islands of suns from our backyard. They come in every possible shapes and forms, spherical, elliptical, with a central bulge, helix arms. From us they can be seen face on or from the side. The largest galaxy in the sky due to its close distance is the Andromeda galaxy. In the sky it covers the area of four full moons. <laughs> Imagine the galaxy shining bright in our sky, that would look fantastic. To capture M31 in one frame you need a rather short scope. Other galaxies are medium sized, M33 or M101 taking nearly one full moon in comparison. And others seem to be just tiny, M98 or others. To fetch details on them your scope must be rather long. All galaxies are very dim, that's due to their enormous distance to us. Some of them are dozens or hundreds of million light years away. So in every case, the scope needs to be wide to fetch every photon available. So. Let's do a summary. For stars, or let's say star fields, you need a short scope. For nebulas, as they are big and dim, a short but wide scope is suitable. For star clusters, an intermedium long scope is needed, as they are bigger than tiny planets but smaller than widespread nebular regions. And galaxies? Are we talking of M31, the Andromeda galaxy, that plays in the same league than nebula fields, or tiny and distant galaxies? The object defines the length of your scope. So that's it. A quick rundown on the objects that can be spotted in the night sky. What are the takeaway messages? In the solar system, planets are tiny. You will need a long scope for them, but not a wide scope as they are very bright. The deep sky objects? Nebulas are huge and so are many galaxies. Deep sky imaging is not about magnification. Most objects would be cut in pieces if magnified too much. The opposite is true. You need a short but wide scope for most deep sky objects. Only faint and distant galaxies call for longer equipment. So the first episode of this tutorial is over. I hope you learned a few things here. The next topic will be a short overview of the night sky. Now, as you know how bright planets are, you probably want to know in which direction to turn to spot them, don't you? Next steps then will be technical terms like focal length and aperture. We called it length and width of the scope here, and how the classifying terms of the telescopes are connected. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and or leave comments below.
more importantly, if you find this tutorial helpful and know someone struggling to find a grip on this hobby, point them here, we must spread this amazing hobby. And finally, if you just started out with this journey, take a break. Step outside and just gaze. Thousands of stars, the eternity of space, let all that sink into you. Clear skies everyone, until next time here on Catching Photons.